one. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all super duper on the same page about definitions of polyphyletic, paraphyletic, and monophyletic, because it pops up a couple of times in the exam. So these are all definitions from your textbook. I'm not going to read them out loud for you. You can pause the YouTube video and you can check them out if you want. The reason that these things are useful is that they, they pop up when we're talking about systematics a lot and when we're talking about patterns of parallel or convergent evolution. So importantly, in modern systematics, which is kind of the way we name things, equivalent levels of the Linnaean taxonomic hierarchy should be reciprocally monophyletic. So that means if you want to describe a new genus, you can't render any existing genera paraphyletic. Right. And so similarly, if you want to call two different groups classes, you have to make sure that one class doesn't render another class paraphyletic. So that's that's the you've probably all at this point been exposed to the idea that birds renders reptiles as classically defined paraphyletic. Um, if you want to talk about a paraphyletic grouping, it's often referred to as a grade. So grades can be paraphyletic, but clades cannot. Clades are by definition monophyletic. And then traits that have arisen as a result of convergent or parallel evolution are often described as polyphyletic. So if something seems to pop up all over the place across a phylogeny and it seems to have arisen multiple times independently, then you could talk about that as being polyphyletic. So a classic example is flapping flight in tetrapods, which has arisen in pterosaurs, uh, the non-avian dinosaurs at least, or the avian dinosaurs rather, at least once, and then in bats. And monophyly, monophyly is also uh, important for some kinds of species concepts. So, so species concepts that incorporate phylogenetic information, like the phylogenetic species concept, include the concept of monophyly as part of their definition. And because species uh, are composed of populations that are interbreeding, one succinct way of defining a phylogenetic species with it within the phylogenetic species concept is by saying it's, it's the smallest monophyletic unit. It's the smallest monophyletic clade or lineage, depending on who you're asking. So I'm just going to, with that being said, I'm just going to zoom around a little bit and show a few different examples of the way I look at phylogenies and, and talk about what's monophyletic, what's paraphyletic, what's polyphyletic. So if we look at kind of a phylogeny of life, for example, we can, we can zoom in on the, um, let's zoom in on the animals first. So there's ectysozoans, which includes insects, tardigrades, nematodes, that's a, that's a monophyletic unit, the ectysozoa. The lophotrochozoa includes mollusks, annelids, and um, some other really uh, cute organisms like uh, brachiopods, which is a really common fossil around here. Those are also lophotrochozoans. Platyhelminths, like uh, tapeworms and liver flukes, and the super duper cute uh, dugesia or planaria that y'all might have played around with. Planaria. Images, yeah, these, these little cute little cross-eyed triangle head puppies. Um, those are lophotrochozoans. And then if we go down to uh, deuterostomes, there's echinoderms, which includes starfish and uh, sea cucumbers, crinoids, things like that. That's a monophyletic unit, that's a, that's a phylum. And then uh, chordata gets a little bit tricky. You'll notice that there's a lot of little branches coming off here. And the way we think about some of the chordates traditionally doesn't always line up with a modern approach to systematics. So for example, you could argue that the chondrichthys, which include sharks and rays, are fishes. And the actinopterygii, which is a lot of the things that you think of when you think of fishes. Um, if, you, if you picture a fish in your mind, you'll, and it's not a shark, you're probably thinking of uh, a ray-finned fish or an actinopterygid. Um, these, these are often what you call fishes, 
And then over here, you'll notice the sarcopterygy includes things like amphibians and amniotes, but it also includes these little guys right here. Um, coelacanths. So a coelacanth, for those of you who don't know, coelacanth. Canth. Are these lobe-finned fishes that look very fishy. You can get a plushie on Amazon if you want. These coelacanths are fish-like, but they're in our clade within the vertebrates. So they're, not only are they teleost fish, just like actinopterygid fishes are, but they're also, they're within our sarcopterygid uh, clade or lineage. So amniotes, amphibians, and coelacanths form a clade that's reciprocally monophyletic with the actinopterygii, but coelacanths, Actinopterygii and sometimes sharks and rays are all considered fishes. And according to most people, uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians are not fishes. But from a strict sort of phylogenetic systematics standpoint, fishes cannot be a class in the Linnaean taxonomic hierarchy if you also want mammals and reptiles and amphibians to be classes unto themselves because they would render fishes paraphyletic. So fishes is a paraphyletic grade as it's typically used in English. Even though the actinopterygii are, uh, they're a monophyletic clade. Uh, and then if you bop on over to the amniotes you'll notice that mammals that's cool that's a monophyletic clade everything that you would call a mammal from platypuses to giraffes to whales to bats to kangaroos and koalas that's a monophyletic clade but then once you get into the sauropsida you'll notice it gets a little tricky there's um there's some things you can start to see the Lepidosauria over here. There are, there are snakes and lizards. Uh, there's some unclassified squamates, which are also snakes and lizards. But there's also turtles over here. And then these archosaurs, which include a lot of things that are birds. So here's parrots. And then somewhere, Passeriformes is a, a really huge clade of birds that includes a lot of the things that you think of when you think bird. Um, oops. Apodiformes. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool birdie birds, but. Um, Somewhere in here are uh, non-avian dinosaurs, which are not represented on this phylogeny just because this is all based on DNA. And then also crocodiles. So you'll notice that crocodiles are, you know, in the broad sense, the, the crocodilia, they're more closely related to birds than they are to lizards. So birds can't be a class alongside reptilia. If, if you want reptilia to be a class, um, that's, that would render reptilia paraphyletic. So, um, and then even more broadly, sometimes uh, reptiles and amphibians are grouped together that, as they are, for example, in herpetology. And that's a, that's a very paraphyletic Grade, grade as well because it excludes mammals. So herpetology is the study of a paraphyletic grade if, you, if you're really inclusive about it. And then also reptilia is a paraphyletic grade if, if you're also considering birds a class. So just a couple, just like 14 or 15 more examples of that and then 
then we'll get out of here. Uh, really similarly to reptiles versus birds, uh, crustaceans is actually a paraphyletic grade if you want insects to be a monophyletic class alongside crustaceans. You, you can't do that. That's actually incompatible because there are some crustaceans, namely the remipedes, which look a little bit like little centipedes. Let me see if I can pull this up. Remipede. Right, they look, they look kind of like little swimmy centipedes. But they're actually more closely related to insects, even though they're a crustacean. They're more closely related to insects than they are to other crustaceans. So if you want to think about amniotes, these are like the crocodiles, insects are like the birds, and every other crustacean is like, you know, lizards and turtles. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, so hexapoda, which includes the insects, is a monophyletic grouping, but crustacea is not as it's typically conceptualized because crustacea as it's traditionally defined doesn't include insects. So in order to talk about a monophyletic group that is that includes crustaceans, you'd have to talk about, um, I don't know, maybe the mandibulata or something like that. Other examples? Oh yeah, so fungi, super duper weird. So here, where are we? Here's a quick little paper on multicellularity and fungi. As you probably know, there are a bunch of fungi like yeasts that are unicellular, and there are obviously a bunch of fungi that are multicellular like uh, mushrooms and morels. We don't really know what the ancestral state was for the last common ancestor of all fungi or the most recent common ancestor of all fungi. So we don't know if the most recent common ancestor of all living fungi was multicellular or unicellular because both of those assumptions imply a lot of gains or losses of either multicellularity or unicellularity. So here you can think about gains of multicellularity and then here you can think about losses of multicellularity with a multicellular um, most recent common ancestor. So this, this model assumes a unicellular most recent common ancestor for all fungi and shows all the times multicellularity would have had to have been gained independently across the phylogeny. And this model shows a putative multicellular ancestor for all, uh, for you know the most recent common ancestor for all fungi and a bunch of losses throughout the phylogeny. And so under these two models, either multicellularity is monophyletic and unicellularity has arisen convergently or polyphyletically many times throughout the phylogeny, 16 times throughout the phylogeny, or um, multicellularity is polyphyletic within the fungi. So, you know, multicellularity has evolved through convergent evolution in the fungi. So we, don't, we actually don't know because both of them uh, require so many gains or losses it's hard to really distinguish between these two hypotheses. So I think this is still actually an open question as to whether the ancestral condition for the most recent common ancestor of all fungi was multicellular or unicellular. So that's kind of cool. Um, this one, this one. Oh yeah, so uh, one of the maybe second week of class or first week of class, I talked about this new paper in which the authors show that maybe there's only two domains of life because according to their most recent analyses, the eukarya renders archaea paraphyletic. 
So in this case, if you want to think about our amniote analogy, uh, eukaryotes are the birds, the Asgardians, the, the Asgard archaeal clade is the crocodiliomorphs, and then the rest of the archaea is the other reptiles. And then bacteria are, oh yeah, these are actually more archaea, and then the bacteria are also cool, they're separate. So the two domains of life might actually be bacteria and archaea, with eukarya a smaller uh, level, a lower, or yeah, a, a less inclusive level of the Linnaean taxonomic hierarchy. Because here we are, way down here, rendering archaea paraphyletic. That's kind of cool. Uh, similarly, if you're into plants, a lot of times you can find field guides to like ferns and their allies. And often that means tracheophytes with no seeds, plus sometimes bryophytes and, you know, mosses, liverworts, hornworts. And so seed plants, we've known for a really long time, is a monophyletic group, but ferns and their allies is a paraphyletic group. This is a phylogeny showing different types of vision throughout the animal phylogeny. So uh, green and blue is just like there's photoreception, but there's not really image forming uh, lenses or anything. Whereas the yellow and red imply the ability of the animal to actually form and process images with its eyes and brains. So the ability to form and process images in its eyes and brains has arisen in these yellow spots here, 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 here. And then high resolution vision has arisen at least three times in vertebrates, cephalopods, and then insects and crustaceans. So uh, both low and high resolution vision could be considered polyphyletic with respect to sort of the animal phylogeny. I'm going to come back to this in a second. And analogously, this is a phylogeny showing all the originations of Hostoria structures in plants, which facilitate parasitism. And you can see that's also really polyphyletic. So that all the red taxa have examples um, that include uh, parasitic or hemiparasitic plants, and they have Hostoria that have evolved. So Hostoria is also really polyphyletic. Uh, in, in the plants. And then lastly, I, I want to talk about biogeography a little bit, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in another lecture as well, but um, one way of thinking about the island progression rule in, uh, yeah. So this, this island progression rule in different islands in Hawaii is contingent upon the idea that um, the different islands in the Hawaiian hotspot arose at different periods of time. And, and basically, you could think about different hypotheses for what sort of biogeographic patterns would result as, um, you know, because of this process of sequential island formation. And two potential alternatives are either that there are uh, clades that are reciprocally monophyletic to each other on each of the islands. So here there's just a clade of taxa that are only found on Kauai, and a clade of taxa that are only found on Oahu, a clade that are only found on Maui, and a clade that are only found on the big island of Hawaii. Whereas here, uh, the taxa in Kauai form a paraphyletic grade with respect to the other islands. So all the other islands are kind of nested within this Kauai grade. So Kauai and the other islands are not reciprocally monophyletic with respect to each other. And similarly, Oahu forms a grade that's paraphyletic with respect to Maui and Hawaii. Hawaii is the only one here that is a monophyletic clade. So there's different ways that you can conceptualize uh, potential hypotheses that are sort of consistent with the island progression rule. And, and both of these 
ideas are kind of consistent with the island progression rule, as, as you may have seen from the Shaw and Gillespie 2016 paper, if you're working on that adaptive radiation question. Um, and so here in the, the Landis et al. paper, they, they're they looking for um, where the members of the Hawaiian Silver Sword Alliance are from. And so they're, they're doing these, they've, they've mapped out um, where these current taxa are found now, but then also they're trying to figure out what the ancestral state reconstruction is, what, what the ancestral range was for these different taxa. And these pie charts are representing sort of different, uh, you know, you could think of them as different probabilities that these ranges are where the ancestor was from. So it's, it's a little bit, it's obviously a little bit complicated, but just to sort of walk you through kind of the, the really basic stuff, Kauai is the oldest island, and that's where this clade is definitely from. But you can see that there have been a few colonization events to other islands. So if you, if you look over here, Maui is this kind of forest green color here. So there's, uh, there's a clade, or there's, there's a lineage that has arrived in Maui from within this Kauai clade. So just to, just to kind of review the major islands of the Hawaiian archipelago are Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, Kauai. And so Hawaii is the youngest one, that's the yellow over here, but there have been two separate colonization events of Hawaii from within this larger kind of Maui and Oahu clade. And actually Oahu is, is not represented as early on as you would think in the phylogeny. So it seems like maybe this, uh, the Silver Swords might have skipped Oahu on their way to Maui or something like that. That's, that's kind of what this pattern indicates a little bit. And then these are, these are outgroup taxa from, from North America. And similarly, um, I should probably mention that the OG is outgroup. So that just means whatever the closest relative to all these taxa, that's not like a part of this, you know, island adaptive radiation. So I think that's, I think that's all I wanted to say for this part. But I just wanted to make sure that you were sort of clear on polyphyletic, paraphyletic, monophyletic, and how to sort of look at phylogenies and figure out what's happening. Um, maybe, maybe the last thing I'll do is just really quickly kind of open up the Iceland data. Oh man, this doesn't want to go. So from your exam, in the COVID-19 question, you can see all these little, all these little green lollipop tips are the Iceland data. Let's see how I can get this. Uh, right now on the x-axis is time. So this is actually when the sequences were collected from the, the person that had it. So you'll notice there's no Iceland data from before uh, sort of late February. And that's potentially because there weren't a lot of, um, there weren't maybe any COVID-19 cases from Iceland uh, at that time, before that time. If we showed divergence, you can see that these different Iceland taxa, some of them are closely related to each other, which indicates that these were probably, these may have been a result of community spread within, uh, within Iceland. These, these are all also really similar to each other so that these might be community spread. But then if we, um, <laughs> if we remove this label and just show how everything is related to each other, you can see that it's, it's actually really hard to find um, Iceland because it's so similar. They, there's just so many countries represented here that um, it's really hard to, to distinguish the colors from each other but Iceland has a lot of taxa. Um, Norway and Denmark, the Netherlands, 
are also similarly, you know, potentially polyphyletic in this uh, tree. And also, you know, they're all really uh, kind of distributed from each other, which indicates that there's probably multiple introduction events. If you, if you play it, I don't know if you guys have looked at this. But you can you can show sort of the progression of the disease if you press play here. So right now in the sort of replay, the disease is only present in China. But at this point, it's already spread to other places around the world, including California and England. So here we can watch if I relabel the branch length as time, we can watch these new data points arise on the map here. And so spatially, they're trying to connect dots that seem to be closely related to each other. So what you're seeing with this network of sort of gray lines that's arising are potential colonization events or potential introduction events of this disease. So already on this view, there's several lines leading into Iceland. So this is a phylogeny that's kind of similar to the way we would usually conceptualize them in this class. But this view is different than the way we usually think about um, phylogenetic data in this class, which is trying to represent uh, evolutionarily uh, similar taxa with connections, with lines. And then as more and more cases pile up from the different countries, the dots get bigger. So dot size eventually scales with the number of cases that have, that have been, I think, sequenced from that country. So this website is not keeping track of the overall number of reported cases from each country. It's just mapping out how many sequences have been um, completely sequenced from that country. So at this point, all of a sudden, there's a lot of cases in Iceland. And they pop up in a lot of different places on this map here. So you can see the dots get bigger if I hover my mouse over there. English dots are also popping up from a few different places in the phylogeny here. So unfortunately, these lines don't have directionality associated with them, so it's a little bit hard to follow how many separate introductions there were to Iceland versus how many um, introductions there were going from Iceland to other places. But in general, the sort of the take home message is that the, the lines connecting uh, the islands represent uh, closely related sequences that are from different places. Cool. So I think that's going to be all for polyphyletic, paraphyletic, monophyletic.